Welcome, folks, on YouTube. I wanted to give an introduction to sublevel set persistent homology, which we actually haven't talked too much about in this class. So here we have a function, you know, this bumpy function. And in sublevel set persistence, you use a function defined on a space in order to filter that space. So essentially, imagine that this is a function defined on a square. OK, so there's a square domain on the bottom. And then there's this function defined on the square. All right. In sublevel set persistence, you, you chop at a certain height, and you only include the parts of your square where the function is beneath that height. So when you chop at a low height, you know you only include very few uh, portions of your space. But as you raise the height level and you chop at that height, you're including more and more regions of the bottom square. This, in fact, isn't a square. This is the energy function of the pentane molecule. And so I've plotted the energy um, over a torus. It's a square with, with opposite edges identified. So, you know, I really want to identify the left and the right edges and the bottom and the top edges. And, and once I do so, I get a torus. Okay. And the reason why it's a torus is because this the energy of this pentane molecule is defined by two angles. This angle and this angle. So there's really two circular factors um, that describe what configuration this molecule is in. You know, that's why I have that circle and this circle, which together parameterize what are, what are these two angles. Okay, so this is really a function on a torus. And in sublevels of persistence, as we raise this energy barrier, we're gonna include more and more of the torus. So on the left, I'm showing the sublevel sets of the torus. Again, it's a torus because right and left sides are identified, top and bottom were identified. And when I cut at this low energy barrier, I only include that little bit of the torus. When I increase my level, I intersect four other parts. Increase again, I intersect four new parts and the, the bits that I had before got, got bigger. And then things start merging up, right? So I've, I've um, sort of surpassed the energy barrier where previously these two um, uh, conformations couldn't be traversed between at the current energy. But then when I raise the energy barrier, now the molecule can switch from one configuration to the other. I keep adding more and more of the torus until eventually almost all the torus has been has been included. I guess you know the next step would be once this becomes yellow as well. All right, so that's my picture of slicing slicing the torus, the square with antipodal points identified based on what heights you want to look at. So we get this increasing sequence of spaces as the yellow region beneath our energy threshold grows. And whenever you have an increasing sequence of spaces, you can compute the persistent homology. So before we were increasing our spaces by growing balls, but now we're increasing our spaces just by um, relaxing this energy barrier. So the persistent homology will track the number of connected components and one dimensional holes. So Red will be our zero dimensional homology, the connected components. Blue will be our one dimensional homology, the one dimensional holes. And green will be our two dimensional homology, which only appears at the, at the very end once the entire torus has been included. So at, at this energy barrier, I have just a single connected component. And that's why this vertical line intersects just one zero dimensional bar. As I add more to my space, I now have five connected components. And that's why I intersect five zero dimensional bars. As I add more to my space, I get four new connected components represented here. And now I have my first merge event, right? These four connected components that were born here have now merged together. And so those bars disappear. And I only have the five connected components that remain. 
I get now to a single connected component and I have four one-dimensional holes. Those four one-dimensional holes you can see here. Okay. I increase the scale. You see I have these bridges that form from left to right and top to bottom on a torus that creates two more one-dimensional loops. Um, what happens here, ah, I have more bridges that form. So before I only had one bridge from top to bottom and one bridge from left to right. But now I have multiple bridges from top to bottom and multiple bridges from left to right, giving me more one dimensional holes. Next, what's gonna happen is these four holes are going to fill in, I believe, indeed. And so we lost those four one dimensional bars. All right, we get to this portion where everything has been included in the torus except for this one bit. This is a punctured torus. I think in this class we showed how a punctured torus is the same shape as two circles glued together, meaning, meaning a single connected component and two one-dimensional holes. And then I didn't show the final sublevel set, which is when the entire torus is included. And, and that would be for this vertical line here where at the very end, you have a single connecting component, two one-dimensional holes, and the entire torus has a single two-dimensional hole as well. All right, so thanks so much. That's my introduction to sublevel set persistent homology. It's the second most common way of producing persistent homology bars. You don't have a point cloud data set and you're growing balls around each, each point. Instead, you, um, you have a function defined on a space and you slice that space to include more and more of it, depending on, on um, what, which portions of the space are currently beneath the height barrier you've chosen for your function. Any public questions? Thanks so much. <laughs>